بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الرحم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين we alhamdulillah have tawfiq to continue our study of moral concepts alhamdulillah in the previous session we talked about those concepts which are obligational because we said there are seven major moral concepts which are divided into two groups evaluative and obligational arzashi evaluative Elzami obligation. Oat and oat not and obligation are discussed. As you remember, we made a distinction between three types of necessity. Al wujub that something is you know necessary by itself by its essence something it is necessary by the other or in relation to something else and then we explain that how our mind has come up with the concept of moral obligation or moral out or out not and that is by saying that if you want this end, this ideal, like perfection, this action is needed, or this quality is needed. So this quality leads to that perfection or nearness to God. Allah Metabatabai uses al wujub bil ghair Ayatollah Misba uses wujub bil qiyas ila al ghair and we said both can be correct. Depending, do you mean perfection as an idea or perfection which has happened? Perfection as an idea is illah, perfection as a reality is ma'lul. Because al illatul ghaiyah comes before as illah, but its reality comes afterwards. You make the chair, why? Because you want to sit. You want to have rest. But the actual sitting and resting comes after the chair is made. So what is illatul ghaiya? The actual sitting, no, the actual sitting has not happened. Illatul ghaiya, which is sharikul illatul fa'iliya, which is motivating the agent, is the imagination or the conception that I am going to benefit for this purpose that purpose is before but materialization of purpose comes later therefore we said you can say <coughs> this action is made necessary because I want perfection or you can say this action produces perfection in any case alhamdulillah we talked about this now we want to move on to the concept of good and bad. What is moral goodness? What is moral badness? Okay? So, among moral philosophers, there are different views, different schools of thought about what is the definition of moral goodness and badness and how we understand moral goodness and badness. Before pointing to differences here, there is a point in Ayatollah Misbah's book which might be useful because there is a similar debate, not in moral philosophy, but in philosophy in general about beauty in Ilmul Jamal 
what makes something beautiful or ugly? There's a discussion. Some people say beauty is like color. Is mafhum mahovi is something which exists independently. Some people say beauty is not mafhum mahovi. Beauty is to be taken after reflection. It's entezari. Some people say beauty is only understood by intuition. Some people say beauty is conventional and based on the contract. Something that is good and beautiful in one culture, maybe not beautiful in another culture. So there are different views about what is beauty. Okay? Similar to that, not exactly the same, but similar to that is the discussion about moral goodness or moral badness. Or in Arabic, we say, al husnu wal qubh I have said many times uh, here in other lectures that in Arabic there is a difference between husn and khayr. Or between qubh and sharr. Khayr means good and sometimes is better. Host means goodness with beauty. There is always beauty in the meaning of host. Hassan means good and beautiful. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنًا or يَقُولُوا الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنًا means something which is good and beautiful. You should say something which is good and beautiful. Something which is appreciated, which is pleasant, which is nice. Not just good. I can, for example, say something good to you, but at the same time, say it in the way that you feel offended. Yeah? For example, you know, someone has a bad habit for example in eating something or doing something okay he should stop it but there are different ways to say to him to stop it you can say in the way that he would appreciate you can say in the way that he would get angry and do more say something which is good and beautiful Nice. Okay. Now we want to see when we say something is good or bad in English. Morally good or bad. Or we say it's in Arabic hasanun or qabihun. What does it mean? Okay. Allah metabatabai rahmatullah alayhi has a general idea in many discussions in al mizan he applies this general idea he believes that normally terms are first and primarily coined for physical and material use but then little by little, there is extension made in the meaning. They are stretched to be applied to immaterial things. For example, light initially is coined for physical light. But then we do tosa, we extend the meaning and we can use it even for light of iman. For light of Amal Saleh, for light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A scale, Mizan. Mizan is primarily, initially coined for what? For the instrument by which shopkeepers, for example, weigh things. But we do tosa'a, we extend and expand the meaning to use it for any way of weighing and comparing things. Even it can be not physical things. 
yeah, like mizanul amal. Mizanul amal is not by gram or kilogram, yeah. But still, we use the term which initially was made for the physical use. The same is with husn and qub. Allah Metabatabai in volume 5 of Al Mizan, he says, it might be said that initially, Hosn was coined in Arabic for physical beauty, a beauty that appears on face of someone, or body of someone. If someone's face and body is pleasant, it's attractive, it's nice, they call it he has or she has husn. Or maybe they use it even for other things. For example, this horse is beautiful. This flower is beautiful, but initially for something physical. Hope also for ugliness, something which you don't like to look at it. Okay? But after this initial meaning, it was expanded. The meaning was expanded, stretched to include, for example, actions which we find pleasant, like justice, ihsan, adl, keeping promises, yeah? We have now used the term host for such action. We say Adl has husn or Al Adlu Hasanu Al Ihsan Hasanu. It's good and beautiful. Or we say Adul Mukhabihun. Qubh initially means ugliness, which is physical ugliness, but now we use it for action. This is the idea of Allame about how our mind comes to understand this goodness or badness. But in addition to this discussion, we have another discussion, which is might maybe more important. Because you may say, okay, whatever is the way our mind comes to this, the main point is what is actually moral goodness or moral badness or moral beauty or moral ugliness? What is it? Like beauty, what is it that makes something beautiful? You know, there are many, many discussions about this. We refer here to five major views among moral philosophers. Five major views among moral philosophers. About what? Ah. What is morally good? What is morally bad? The first view is the view that says Moral goodness and badness are real, are objective, are external, like mahiyat. In the same way that you have Johar and Araz, yeah, you have substance, you have accidents, among accidents, you have colors, all these mahiyya, these mafahim mahuvi, this ma'gulat ula. I hope you remember what we discussed. We have three concepts, yeah? Al ma'gulat al ula, or mafahim mahuvi, or al ma'gulat al thani, al mantari, or falsafi. I hope you remember. You know, you cannot forget these things because these are tools that we keep referring to. So some people say moral goodness and moral badness are real things 
are mahiyat, are mafahim mahuvi that exist outside, and we should only understand them. How do you understand them? Not by five senses that you have. Because you cannot hear morality. You know, something is good or bad, you cannot hear that. Or you cannot watch it, or you cannot smell it or taste it. But you can have immediate understanding of this by your aql through intuition shahood if you remember i explained this when i was referring to discussions they say we human beings have a kind of moral sense a kind of moral understanding it's not those five but it is not also through reasoning we in the same way that you can understand something is beautiful or not, physically, you can also understand something is morally beautiful or not, morally good or not. One of the most famous people who had this idea is G.E. Moore, George Edward Moore. Moore. He was born in 1873 and died in 1958. Okay, he had this idea that we can understand through our intuition moral goodness or badness. And he is considered as founder of the school of, you know, uh, philosophy, moral philosophy, which is based on intuition. According to him, the concept of good is badihi, self-evident, is basic, it cannot be defined, other things can be based on this, but this itself is basic. And it's something that no one can define it. Basit and badihi. Therefore, you cannot define it. He says, if I am asked, he says, if I am asked, for example, if someone, a student, a friend, a colleague, asks me, what is good or which is good? I would say good is good and this is the maximum that can be said. And if I am asked how you define good, my answer is that good cannot be defined. And this is the maximum I can say. So either you understand it through your intuition or you don't understand it. I cannot help you. Every human being. Like, how can you define what is beauty? Physical beauty. Of course, a lot of people will try to define, but some people say we cannot define it. It's something that we just understand. How do you define, you know, for example, uh, a smells? So, according to these people, the concept of good is the basic concept, is the foundation of all moral concepts. Interestingly, Moore had the idea that good is the main one and the obligation also go back to this. For example, duty, obligation, duty should be defined according to good, but good cannot be defined. What is duty? Duty is the action that more than any alternative produces good in the world. So you define duty based on good, but you cannot define good further. What is my moral duty? To do something which brings the maximum balance of good 
to the moon. Okay? Uh, when did we get this? When did we find this? This is part of our creation. At the time of creation. So we had this lack of in the or? They don't believe in that, but they say human beings, when they have un, you know, maturity understanding, they have this. Even a child, after two years, three years, or perhaps even earlier, has a moral sense. You have five senses for physical sensation, but you have also moral sense, according to Moore. You have moral sense. Bertrand Russell who was born in 1872 and died in 1970, was also, at least in part of his life, very much influenced by Moore. He says, good and bad, means moral goodness and badness, are properties that belong to the things independent from our ideas and beliefs like being a square or circle. Whether something is a square or circle has nothing to do with us. It's real. It's a property of something external. Okay. As you see, there is something positive in Moore's view. What is positive in Moore's view? Ah, that he gives some recognition to morality. He doesn't say morality is just based on false imagination. But the problem is that he is not explaining what type of objectivity it has. Plus, he considers morality as mafhum mahovi, which is right. The second view, how many views are there? Five. We said there are five the major theories about moral goodness and badness. The second is to say that goodness and badness only express or are expressions of emotions and feelings of the moral observer or moral judge when you say something is good means you are expressing your happiness and approval when you say something is bad you are expressing your disapproval therefore according to them if someone says to someone else For example, I imagine someone has made a theft. He says, you stole this laptop. <laughs> I am thinking of my stolen laptop. Okay. So he says, you stole this laptop and it is bad. According to this theory, they say, when you say it is bad, you are not adding any new meaning to this. You are just saying you have stolen and I am unhappy. I don't approve this. That's it. You are not making any extra, you know, expression or you know giving any extra information or when you say you have helped this poor person and this is morally good again they say it just means you have helped this person and i am happy with this i approve this that's it there's nothing in the world more than this I am happy. Like, for example, I see my friend has, uh, for example, a dress in, uh, with a certain color that I like. I say you have, for example, 
uh, put on this color and it is good, it means that I am happy, I am enjoying looking at this. Nothing about the reality. This is the second opinion. So these are the people who reduce morality into emotions and feelings and attitudes. These are technical terms. Some people have tried to distinguish between attitude and emotions. We will talk about it, inshallah. The third opinion is the opinion of the people who say morality is just based on agreement or contract. Either we make agreement among ourselves. For example, we come together to form a society, a community, a group, a party, or little by little a culture, a country, and we can agree on something as moral and something as immoral. It's through our agreement, or it can be through a kind of legislation or decision, a kind of contract, but nothing necessarily real. For example, to drive on the right side of the road or left side of the road. It's based on contract or agreement. Can anyone argue that objectively we have to drive on the right side or we have to drive on the left side? Perhaps no one can Argue. What is important is we should agree on something, I should, we should be consistent. Yeah? So, in the same way that in some societies people drive on the right side, and in some societies people drive on the left side, in some societies people say a slavery is good, in some societies a slavery is bad. It's just, just based on, con on contract and agreement. There is no reality behind this. As you imagine, this can be very destructive. It makes morality just a practical decision. Of course, you can say, for our betterment, we agree on being honest. But this means that there is no basis, there is no big difference between honesty or dishonesty. Just practically we approve honesty. Maybe a situation comes that people say it's better to be not honest. Because others are not honest, so it's better that we are not also honest. This was the third view. Now we go on to the fourth view. And this is what is known in the West as divine command theory. Divine command theory. This is the theory which says good and bad are not objective, are not real. They are based on command of a legislator, a lawmaker, someone who has authority and power. For example, divine command theory says it's God who makes good and bad. God says, "Adelu, be just." This makes justice good. This opinion has long history in all different parts of the world. In the West, it goes back to the time of Socrates and before Socrates. Socrates has, in his discussions and dialogue, this as a topic. Is it something good because it is commanded by God or because it is good, it is commanded by God. 
I repeat, is something good because it is commanded by God or because it is good it is commanded by God. We have similar discussion in Christianity, in Judaism, and in Islam. Uh, in Islam, it's very well known as the question of Husnuqob. Are Husnuqob Zati or Arazi, and as a result, Aqli or Shari? Some people don't understand the difference between these two, they mix them up. But these are two levels. First is to say Hosnokop are Zati or Arazi. Second is to say are Agli or Shari. Hosnokop means moral goodness and badness. Zati means essential, means are Hosnokop objective. They go back to the essence of the actions or they are Arazi, accidental, means we can give them and take them away. There is nothing inside, for example, justice that makes it good, or inside injustice that makes it bad. It comes from outside. You can inject goodness and badness to the actions. Based on this question, whatever position you take, then we can move on to the next question. Now. Is Hosnukob something that can be understood by Agl or not? If you say that Hosn and Qob are real, are objective, are independent from us, then there is a chance to say that Agl can try to understand at least part of it. Not all of it, part of it. But if you say there is no such a thing as goodness or badness in reality, and if it is in and it is injected, it is projected by a lawmaker, then we have to ask the lawmaker. Ash'arites had the idea that Al-Hasanu ma hasanahu shari' Ab al-Shari' Shari' means lawmaker, Shari' means religion, law. Al-Hasan, good, morally good, is what Shari considers to be good. Al Qabihuma Qabahahu Shari or Shara. And bad is what Shari or Shar says is bad. So if you ask Asharites why we should keep our promises. Ash'arais would say, because God has said to keep your promises. Otherwise, we were not able to understand. And according to some Ash'arais, actually there was nothing to understand. Because there are two interpretations or major interpretations for the position of Ash'arais. One interpretation is that Ash'arite didn't deny reality of morality, but they wanted to say we cannot understand, we need help of Shari. But there is a more famous interpretation which says not only we cannot understand, there is nothing <laughs> to understand. It is Shari who gives goodness and badness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have told us don't keep your promises. Don't be kind. But he didn't say that. He said, be kind and keep your promises. According to them, there is nothing wrong in thinking the other way. It just has happened that he has chosen this type of moral instructions and we go by them. There is nothing in reality as adl or zulm. What is Adl? Whatever God says, it is Adl. So if your definition of justice is what is commanded by God, then whatever God commands would be just by definition. So there is no problem in God asking something else. But Mu'tazilites, 
the Shiites and some Hanafites, they had this idea that goodness and badness are real. Whether you believe in religion or you don't believe in religion, there is akhlaq, there is morality. Actually, as we discuss in Aqaid, in Baba Hadi Ash, for example, we had this discussion. We said, if we don't believe in akhlaq, in morality prior to religion, we are not able to prove religion. Because one may say, okay, God has sent for example, his word, his book, to a liar, to deceive us. What is wrong with that? If you say, I don't believe in independent understanding of akhlaq, so you cannot prove this would not happen. You can maximum say, this is wrong because it is against what is in the book. Okay, that book can be, na'uzubillah, lie, or mixture of lies and truth. You have to be, to rationally prove that God, who is perfect, would not tell lies, would not want to deceive us. So it means that before coming to religion, you should believe in some moral sense for humanity. Okay? Therefore, we said in Baba Hadi Ash and in Sharh Tajreed, if Husnuqub Aqli is denied, Husnuqub Shar'i will also be rejected. There would be no chance for someone to defend Husnuqub Shar'i because you cannot prove religion. So the Shiites, the Mu'tazilites, which are called Al-Adliya, the people of justice, they had the idea, yes, yeah, yeah we are moving uh, to number five, but still I am talking about number four. I am saying the opposite view. The Shiites and the Mu'tazilites had the idea that Morality is not based on just agreement or contract or decision. And morality is not based on divine command. Okay, morality has some objectivity, has some reality. You know, if you read the books of Mu'tazilite and Asharite, you find this debate very much. That Asharites, they say, if we say God asks us to do good things, this means that we are limiting God. If we say that something which is good can be commanded by God and something which is bad cannot be commanded by God, according to them, means that you are making God subordinate to akhlaq. It's a problem. Mu'tazilites and Shiites argue the other way. They say, if you say God can make decisions without observing goodness and badness, you are making decisions of God arbitrary. So you are making God unwise. Na'udhu billah. He just, you know, Na'uzu Billah arbitrarily says, do this, don't do that. He could have said something else. We believe that God observes real interest and harm. If you remember in Usul al-Fiqh, we had this discussion. Al-Ahkam tabi'atun lil-masalih wal-mafasid al even in Sharia, let alone Akhlaq, even in Sharia, in Fiqh, everything is based on reason. <coughs> if something is wajib or mustahab, it's because there is maslaha in it. Either maslaha is so much which is mulzima, 
compelling or masla is there but even without that we can do it and we can also without do it, uh, doing it we can have perfection this is mustaha ghayrul mulzam mafsada is also sometimes too much blocks the way for perfection makes it haram what we call this maslaha mafsada who remembers from usul al fiqh al mafsada which blocks the way for perfection we said maslaha is mulzama or ghayr al mulzama mafsada is no mafsada can never be mulzama mufawwata mufawwata or ghayr al mufawwata mufawwata means makes perfection yafut means goes away you miss the perfection mufawwat is opposite to mulzam mulzam means compelling this means damages okay Fata yafuto. This is tafid. Baba tafil is mutaaddi. Yeah. Fata yafuto is lazim, mufawid. Yes. How is the Ashra like answer? The Quran is often asked, Fala yafuto. Yes. How many times you say you might increase your brains? What does Ashra answer to that? According to Ashra, you do taqul in, for example, something about reasons for religion and then you do ta'aqul for understanding the text not more than that so you do ta'aqul to understand the ash'ari view <laughs> so the debates between ash'arites on the one hand and Adliya on the other hand was a matter of whether we defend God's wisdom according to Ahlul Adl and justice because it also very much connects to the issue of justice because if we say we cannot understand and it is God who says what is good, what is bad. Then if it is arbitrary, why people should be sent to hell for something which is arbitrary? Okay? So, one side tries to defend wisdom and justice of God. The other side, which is Asharai, they try to protect in their view the power and sovereignty of God. But we say, with all respect to our brothers, Asharite brothers, that you are not giving, making any service to God by projecting Him as a very powerful dictator. As a person who is very powerful, no one can question his decision and his decisions are arbitrary. Pardon? Almost the yes. There must be a maslaha. We believe whatever God tells us, this is a very important question. We discussed this in Aqaid. Whatever God, God the Almighty tells us to do or not to do are based on real facts. And if we had knowledge, I and you would have come to the same conclusion because God is aglikul, is the perfect agl and he has given us little agl if our agl was perfect if we had all the information that he has we would have come to the same conclusion right now to certain extent we understand yeah many principles of akhlaq we understand by ourselves and religion god uh, and god just confirm be kind to your parents be kind to your children look after the elderly people the needy people the poor people keep your promise be generous not be selfish we all understand 
Yes, when details come, when conflicts come, we need guidance. But guidance is different from dictation, um, you know, imposition. God is a teacher. He teaches you what you were not able to understand. God is not a dictator. So if me and you had access to the facts that God knows, we would have made the same conclusion. This is why our ulama say, remember this, they say, Al-Wajibatul Aqliyah Al-Tafun Fil Wajibat Al-Shariyah They say, the religious Sorry, yes, Al-Wajibat Al-Shariyah Al-Tafun Fil Wajibat Al-Aqliyah Religious obligations, religious commands are indeed lutf, are favors for us to understand intellectual obligations. Share is just helping us to find the answer. He is not giving arbitrary answers. Al wajibat al tafun fil wajibat al aqli. Or as we had in Ilmu Usul, that Ahkam Mulavi indeed are Irshadun ila Hukm al aql They show us what is the judgment of Aql. Can I ask a question, please? Yes. You say in philosophy that the first thing more than the action, which is the simple thing. So Aql was made before everything. That's Aql is different from our Aql. How is different? So what was that Aql? That means in independent being which is immaterial and it's perfect and it is free from any potentiality in discussion about Hosnu Qob our ulama as you know make different meanings of a list of different meanings of goodness and badness and they say some of them are not questioned by Asharite or Mu'tazila, they agree. Like, for example, goodness and badness in the sense of perfection, in the sense of serving purpose, in the sense of being pleasant or unpleasant. These are not questioned by Asharites. Even Asharites accept that these can be understood by Aql. For example, is this knife good or bad in the sense of serving our purpose? Asharites accept we don't need religion to tell us this knife is good or bad. Is this ice cream delicious or not? Goodness in this sense. Again, we understand by our own senses. What was controversial was the meaning of moral goodness in the sense of something which is praised, or moral badness in the sense of something which is blamed. Okay? Ash'arite said this is not understood by us, but Mu'tazilite and Shia say it's understood by us in this sense. Means we can understand what action is praiseworthy, what action is blameworthy. Okay. Let's go to the fifth view. If I want to connect this to the fourth view, I can say it in this way. Opposite to the view of Ash'arites is that Hosnokop is Zati, it's real, it's objective. But this can be understood in two ways. When it is real, you tell me, how can something be real? What type of concepts are real? Pardon? When it doesn't Okay. There are two ways the concept can be real. One is to be ma'ghul ula, one is to be ma'ghul saniya falsafi. 
Okay? The first theory was like more by saying that it is mafhum mahavi, ma'ghul ula. So, if you are a Mu'tazali or Shia, you can say something like that, but it's not necessary. There is another option that we prefer is the fifth view and to say that moral goodness and badness are real, are objective, but not independent, uh, independently existing outside. It's not like color, it's not like shape, size. It is something that أروزه في الزهن واتصافه في الخارج It's a property, it's a quality that mind can discover but it's about outside What was the example? For معقول ثانية فلسفي Secondary philosophical intelligible Causality Fire is burning the wood. Fire is the cause for burning. But do we have outside anything independent from fire and wood which we can call causality? Or causality is what our mind takes out from this relation. It's real. It's not false. It's not contract. Because really fire does burn. It's real, but at the same time it is not mahubi, it is saniya falsafi. Or like emkan. Emkan is there for any mahiya, there is emkan. But is emkan independent? No. So, uh, if you are using Arabic text, you find this, you know, in philosophy, very much they say, for mafahim mahovi, there is ma bihil eza fil kharaj. Means there is something outside, independent, that this refers to it, for mahovi. But for ma'ulat saniya falsafi, there is no ma bi eza kharaj. There is man shay intiza. Manshaul intaza means there is something outside from which your mind can abstract this concept. If something is a square or circle, this is outside. A square and circle is outside, and we understand them, but they are independently there. But when we say something is mumkin or a figure is zoj or fat is even or odd or something is cause or ma'lul, something is above or under, something is before or after, all these are mafahim, falsafi, means they apply to things which are outside. They describe things which are outside. It tasaf is fil kharaj, but these concepts are all in mind, they don't have any independence. So, according to the view that we accept, moral goodness and moral badness are real and objective, but not independently exist. They are ma'ghul thaniya falsafi, secondary, philosophical, intelligible. So, how something becomes good? You tell me. Why some action is considered to be morally good? Use the concept of causality. Use what we said last week about oat and oat nuts. It is good results. If an action leads to the result that we want, we say this is good. What do you want in akhlaq? This is what you define it outside akhlaq. Yes? Your moral ideal has to be decided in your worldview, ideology, whatever it is. Whatever you want to achieve. 
For example, you want perfection, you want nearness to God, you want welfare, you want, I don't know, whatever. Fame, you want power, whatever you want. If an action is the cause for that thing that you want, or in other words, it has a positive relation, it contributes to having that, it becomes morally good. If it has negative relation, means it takes you away from that or blocks the way for that ideal, it becomes bad. If it has no effect, become neutral. Okay? Yeah. Like, for example, drinking water as such is not neither morally good nor morally bad as such. Unless you drink water for <coughs> getting energy to serve, then it becomes morally good. Then we have a discussion about why there are moral differences in the world. Why there are so many moral disagreements? Sometimes the same thing is by some people considered to be good, by some people is considered to be bad. According to the fifth view, when we say morality is a real thing, but real not in the way that G. E. Moore is saying, real in the sense that we say, means ma'ulis saniya falsafi not ma'ulwi. We say the reason for moral disagreements is mainly one of the two. Either people have not understood what could be a good ideal. What is the perfection? Many times people don't agree on what is good or bad because they don't have the same ideal. Yeah? For example, abortion is good or bad? If you think about only worldly pleasure and being comfortable and relaxed and free, then you can say, okay, this woman doesn't want this ba baby, so let her relax. Because the only thing which counts is worldly pleasure. But if you are thinking about our responsibility towards God, about our responsibility towards humanity, you know, value of human life, even a child has value, even value has value, then the situation would be different. So, what is your moral ideal is very important. It makes lots of differences. And the second source for problems is people may disagree about what would lead to that perfection. So what is perfection is different among different people. And what leads to that perfection also can be different. Sometimes maybe people agree, but they disagree about methods and means of reaching perfection. For example, they say we need order in the society. But sometimes they think order happens by force. Some people say order happens by education by formation, not by force. So, morality is based on reality, but don't be surprised that there are disagreements, because there are many things which are real and people still disagree. Yeah? Even about science, there are lots of disagreements. In the past, people used to think that, for example, world is flat and is the earth is center. Now they disagree. Now, there are many things, like, for example, economics. It's a real thing, but people disagree. Psychology, people disagree. Uh, according to some thinkers, they say something nice. Inshallah, if we get chance to talk about ethical relativism, we can discuss this further. This very beautiful point I want to mention. Are you here? So, some people say, because there are disagreements which are fundamental, so there is no one single truth. 
some moral philosophers have replied something very beautiful. They said, who said that if there is single true morality, there must be consensus about it. So that now there is no consensus, you say there is no single true morality or no single truth. Who said which philosopher is able to prove that truth must be agreed on, so if there is no agreement, means there is no truth. You understand? It's a very beautiful point. This can keep you happy for weekend. <laughs> if you really think about it. So, don't be surprised if people disagree about morality. First of all, many of these disagreements are not fundamental. On the surface, they disagree. If you go deeper, you would see there is agreement. I always mention this example, famous classic example, that in the time of Iranian king, Daryush, the Iranian territory was very big. It included parts of Greece and part of India, parts of India. So he was informed that there are people in your territory that burn their dead people. And there are people who eat their dead relatives. The common pattern was to bury them, but some people burn in India and some people eat in some parts of you know Europe. So he asked them, he brought them to the court, said, are you happy to change? For example, to those who were burning, said, are you happy to eat? I said, no, how can we eat our relatives? We burn them because we want to purify them with fire and they will never be, you know, the body will not be spoiled, will not be eaten by animals. Said to the people who were eating, are you happy to burn? I said, no, how can we burn someone that we like? We eat them so that they become part of our body and they continue in us. So all were consistent and insistent. But if you look at the surface, you see they are different. If you go deeper, you see they all wanted to show respect to their dead people. So they had this common morality that we should respect dead people. But based on culture, on customs, on ideologies, they showed it in different ways. In some cultures, if the guest eats all the food, it's good. In some cultures, the guest should leave some of the food. Yes? yes? Not because they morally disagree, because they all want to show kindness to each other, guest to the host, host to the guest. But depending on the custom, some people think if we eat all of it, they think food was not enough. Some people think if we don't eat all of it, they think food was not good. We have to eat all of it so they enjoy it and show that they're... So this is on the surface. Many times if you go deeper. For example, some people think because some cultures don't have the concept of hijab like Islam, so they don't have modesty at all. This is wrong. There is no culture who has no value for modesty. But how they express modesty can be different. It's not that, for example, every woman who doesn't have hijab, na'uzu billah, is bihaya and, you know, immodest. They are very modest, they are very afif, but they think there is no problem. You have to understand that modesty is a concept that all human beings have. But you can have better understanding, more detailed understanding, more perfect understanding. That's another issue. The same is, for example, kindness to parents. You cannot find any culture which says 
you don't need to be kind to your parents. But then, how much and how, to what extent, they are different. But some moral philosophers have said very nicely, if there was no such common concept of kindness to parents, human societies would have stopped to exist. Because if one generation, two generation parents see children are very bad and you know disrespectful and you know not kind, then they say why we should have children. So after two, three generations, humanity would stop. As you see now in some societies, population is in decrease, in decline. Why? Because some children are not kind to parents, so parents decide not to have children. It's better to have a dog. <laughs> because, you know, dog is not going to create trouble for you. If you want children, just till they are very little and listen to you like a pet. <laughs> when they become teenager or old, send them away. Send them away. So this means after a few generations, if it goes like this, population will go to zero. Okay? So human beings have always had this common value of being kind to your parents and also taking care of your children because if parents also stop ca taking care of children they will die in any case if there are differences it's not because morality is not based on reality there is reality but reality doesn't guarantee agreement there can be disagreements what is our moral ideal and how to reach that? These are two areas that people can have this agreement, and this is why we need moral philosophy to discuss in a very nice, uh, scholarly way. We should not attack each other and say, you are not moral, I am moral, you don't have value, I have value. No, everyone has some kind of value. We have to discuss and enter into a nice and respectful discussion to find out how we can improve our understanding and our performance of morality.